Kinfolk, happy Sunday. Beloveds, let us pray. Playful God, you delight in the beauty of this day. Your revelation unfolds through word and human history. You mourn the broken places in the world. Powerful God, most mighty, with your truth, open our hearts and show us the way. Amen. On a previous life, I worked up in Grand Rapids in the Heartside neighborhood up there before it all uh, kind of gentrified and changed. It was a hard place to work, and it was important to my boss at the time that I would spend some nights at Mel Trotter uh, Homeless Shelter for Men. And I didn't need the shelter, uh, and the church that I worked for compensated the organization for my presence there, but it was a helpful tool to help me introduce introduce myself to the people I would be ministering alongside and learn a little bit more about their day-to-day lives. It gave me perspective. You got to get in under curfew. You got to take off your clothes and shoes and you'd wear, we'd wear these little flip-flops and take a shower and put your stuff in a locker and then find your cot. We were not allowed to bring backpacks in with us, for example. Now, I met a man up in walking that hard and dusty road, who seemed to know who I was and what I did for a living. He'd always bring people to me, uh, young men and women who'd need help. Uh, I kind of let him, I had a teeny tiny office at the time, but I let him use it to store things for people. Eventually, we came into this relationship, and over dinner one night, I asked him why he was homeless. Uh, I don't think I used those words, Um, but he said, you know, this is going to be a confusing story. I think I've told you guys this story before. He said, I didn't always live here. I used to be a church pastor. Uh, He said he was a Christian Reformed church pastor. And he told me his story about receiving a call from Jesus uh, to uh, leave his ministry at his church and sell his home and give away his possessions. And he'd spent so much time at the mission doing ministry that it felt natural for him to live there. And so he did. I think about that pastor a lot, kind of assimilating or habituating into the kind of economic refugee camps that populate our American cities. I saw him, I saw in him rather a reflection of a person I thought I could become perhaps someday to my older brother's great fear. I was already living out of my Ford Focus uh, and he cautioned me against that. Mending nets, catching fish. We do the things every day that are expected of us. But occasionally in life, we're struck from the outside by a curious force that says, uh, put that stuff down and follow me, and I will show you some amazing things. Things that you'll find hard to believe. Is this a wise investment? (laughs) Is it going to maximize the return? on our money. I wonder what would have happened to my life if I had chosen to follow that man into the margins for uh, forever. Well, today in our Gospels, we hear two different abandonments that are taking place, two abdications of work. And I think that they're broad enough to help us visualize ourselves and sort of cast ourselves in the story, regardless of who we are. Um, uh, Fred Craddock would call this overhearing the Gospels. We can kind of peek over the shoulders of the disciples in today's lesson. There are two calls that take place on that day on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And I'm going to pull them out of the text like little wriggling fish. We won't leave them there. Uh, uh, Verses pulled out of context uh, are pretext, right? And they will die as surely as a fish out of water. But as Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee, he sees two brothers, Peter and Andrew, casting a net into the sea. They were fishermen. He says to them, follow me. I will make you fish for people. Then immediately they left their nets and followed him. Okay, that's the first abdication, the first abandonment. What what have they done? What have they done? They made a terrible decision from a business perspective, right? They've abandoned their trade, their skills, and now they're just entry-level employees at Jesus Incorporated. Yeah? I don't really think so. I think um, that Jesus gives a curious proposition, 
as though, you know, he says to them, Peter, Andrew, what is your trade? What's, your, what's the business that you're about? And they say, we're fishermen, rabbi. And he says, excellent, I need two fishermen. <laughs> it's all about framing, you know. He, he sees what their real call is. Do you have a sense of call on your life? Maybe it's to help people. Maybe it's to grow things. Maybe it's to teach, I don't know. The Latin word for call is vocari. Vocari, it's where we get the word vocation. But our vocation isn't always our call. Now, Peter and Andrew are fishermen. Are they good fishermen? I I think, well, they appear to uh, have their own boats, which is kind of a big deal at that time. And into their life walks this revolutionary teacher, this healer, this person who is significantly unlike anyone that they've probably ever met before. Does he ask them to leave everything to follow him? Not exactly, if you read the text. I worry about us losing our sense of call these days. Uh, It may seem uh, from the outside that capitalism doesn't have a lot of room in it for call, but the reality is that we commodify people's calls all the time. We commodify something and we reduce it to a wage. And if it's a position to which a person is called, uh, we typically discount that labor because they're willing to do it for less than it's worth. See public school teachers, for example. A lot of people say we've got a shortage of teachers in America or a shortage of nurses or a shortage of other important called positions. Please allow me to assure you there are no shortage of teachers uh, in this country. It's like when they say that there isn't enough work. Uh, No, uh, there's plenty of work. Uh, What we lack are jobs. Uh, You can just stick your head out any window and you can see there's tons of work to be done in this country. What we lack are jobs. No, there's no shortage of teachers, but what's happened is that we've permitted the fulfillment of their calling to replace an equitable share of the excess wealth. Uh, that is produced by public education. Same thing happens a lot, I think, to artists uh, when we choose not to pay them uh, what their art is truly worth, the investment. All kinds of passionate people. They follow a call and we're so thoroughly soaking in the moon juice of market capitalism that we think, well, that's not a profitable use of their labor. Without teachers, our civilization will fall apart. I can't think of a more profitable industry for humanity. Jesus doesn't want Andrew and Peter to abandon their passion, even if it's for fishing. He makes this clear. He wants them to use the skills that they have to support his movement. I think maybe he reasons to himself on that beach, I need some fishermen, because they know how to operate on instinct because they're familiar with danger, because they're willing to take intelligent risks. Fishermen uh, are, well, they're sailors, right? Maybe he's thinking, I'm going to be going, I'm going to be riding around in a lot of boats, so couldn't hurt to have a couple of folks around who know how to sail. Following a movement, pledging ourselves to some cause for healing this world, a radical movement even, supporting a cause, it doesn't require you to abandon your vocation. Just the opposite. Perhaps you have to leave behind certain patterns, processes, and even possessions to which you've grown to feel safe and familiar around. Um, But no, you can be a fisherman for peace and justice. You can be an accountant for the environment. You can be an attorney for the oppressed. I've met several of them recently in my journey with Auntie Sahida. You can be a chef for the hungry. Your skills as a salesperson are important to communicating with a sense of urgency. Well, what about pastors? What is a, what is a church pastor? We're called. I think pastors are sort of these like psychological hospital janitors. This was explained to me by a man that I attended seminary with, who was himself a hospital custodian, a janitor at a hospital in Chicago. That's how he paid for graduate school. And he said, you know, uh, 
If you're a janitor, you're going to be dealing with toilets. And toilets don't always function as designed. And so you're going to be dealing with other people's stuff. But you can't do it sometimes without getting it on you. It's dirty work, but it's got to be done. And my partner is a licensed psychologist. Sometimes after we both work a 12-hour day, we kind of look at each other with a thousand-yard stare. Because working with humans to come alongside them and help them cope with existence is hard and exhausting, especially these days. But we bend our vocation toward the movement. If Jesus can make fishermen into apostles, saints, he can definitely do something amazing with your lived experience. Now, the second part of the story is harder. It's a little bit more visceral. As Jesus went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father, mending their nets. And he called to them as well. Immediately, they left the boat and their father and followed him. Oh, ouch. That's a little bit harder. Now, I know I've preached a month of sermons about adoption and the Bible and about how spiritual relatedness is more important to God than biological kinship. Arguably, it's the only form of kinship that God recognizes. But knowing something and doing it are two totally different things. A couple of different species of fish, you might say. James and John don't just walk away from their profitable jobs. They walk away from their father, their dad. Well, as you know, we live in a weird time in history. For most of human history, the vast majority of human history, the nuclear family has not been a popular system for managing a household. Okay, here he goes again with this old saw. <laughs> I know, but this is important. I think that this is one of the great narratives of the Bible. Outside of a few rare circumstances, if a family is reduced to just two parents and their children, you're likely living through uh, intense and prolonged uh, famine or plague scenarios. Topical, I know. It's interesting to me that at the height of the Roman Empire, the, the nuclear family was, again, emphasized and celebrated. And now at the height of the American Empire, the nuclear family is emphasized. Even in the church, how many churches have said they exist to build strong families? Um, we aren't programmed that way. We're programmed to live together in extended families, in family networks, allo parents with helpers of all generations. The idea of a single parent raising a child would be unknown to our ancestors. The idea of two parents is hard. How on earth can two people raise a whole human being? Got to have five or six, at least. You got to have grandmas and grandpas and a couple of uncles, and you got to have that one cousin that was born really early, and so now he's older than all the rest, but so he's kind of an in between uncle kind of guy. And then you got to have the neighbors, you know, Frank and Sandy, who aren't related by blood, but they helped out last year when grandma got sick, and the list goes on and on and on. All living together, raising children together. If you understand that this is the family model that Jesus is working with in his day and age, it is less revolutionary or countercultural to understand discipleship as kinship. Okay? We've lost a little bit of that today. And it's on us to build our own intentional families. So it wouldn't have been perhaps quite so radical for these young men to leave their father there on the boat. And he likely would have seen them joining this new spiritual family and probably understood that their calling, their vocation, was about to blossom in the light of the sun. The Bible is pretty clear that adoption, or as we say, as I said, intentional family, is in fact more important than biological family. Um, it's, it's why I quoted uh, Dr. Bill Keith uh, last week, may he rest in peace. He always would say that uh, racism is atheism. Well, okay, I'll let you unpack that again on your own. I imagine that for James and John, their father represented a place of security and love without risk. But for each of us, when we take our vocation, 
our calling, whatever we want to call it, our fisher personness, and we take it out into the world where there is less security, we are taking on a calculated risk. And I can't make that choice for you. But we can look to history and see people courageous enough to make those choices, our modern-day apostles. I'll tell you again, you recall how old Martin Luther King Jr. was when he was crucified on the crosshairs of an American rifle. He was 39 years old, 39 years old. At the time of his death, Martin Luther Jr. was a father to four children. They were aged 13, 11, 7, and 5. And Jesus yet called to Martin and asked him to follow him. Immediately he left his church, his wife, his four children, and followed him. And so too did Jesus Christ call to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, living in Germany when he could have lived a very comfortable life as a Christian pastor. But instead, Bonhoeffer left that place of comfort and followed Jesus to what? To where? To Flossenburg concentration camp, where on the day of his death, the pious German Lutheran SS soldiers waited for the prisoner Bonhoeffer to complete his Sunday sermon preaching to the other prisoners. The soldiers took him by the shoulders, and as they marched past, as they marched him past his friend, who was an English prisoner named Payne Best, Bonhoeffer said to his friend, This is the end, and for me, the beginning of life. And then he was stripped naked, walked through the shallow snow, and hanged. Two weeks later, the United States Infantry liberated Flossenburg concentration camp. What had become of these saints to apply their gifts, their vocation, to this movement that we call Christianity. Martin King had made a shift at the end of his life from, in his words, from civil rights to human rights. And he had launched the Poor People's Campaign following his compelling, compelling relationship with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in Memphis, Tennessee, he was demanding socialized welfare for all Americans and an end to endless wars overseas. He was preaching for universal basic income. This was the crime for which he was crucified. On April 3rd, 1968, King preached one of his most famous sermons, I've been to the mountaintop. Out of deference to him, I will quote him, but in my head I feel like a child mumbling the words of a titan. But he said, quote, and then I got to Memphis. And some began to say the threats, or talk about the threats that were out. What would happen to me from some of our sick white brothers? I don't know what will happen. We've got difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now because, because I've been to the, been mountain to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life and longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get there. So I'm happy. I'm not fearing. My and mine eyes have seen the glory seen of the, the coming of the Lord. Of the the following morning, on April 4th, he awoke as usual in his room at the Lorraine Motel. And the last thing he did before he stepped onto that balcony that was going to become the American Golgotha is that he had a pillow fight in his hotel room with his friends. And then moments later, he was killed. To follow Jesus means to accept a certain level of abdication, of 
what? Of security, perhaps profitability, of a lot of things that we tend to cleave to. But it doesn't mean that we lose our call, the thing that we're passionate about. It means rather to take our vocation, to take the thing that calls to us, and apply it to the broken places in the world. The thing that you do so well, kindred, whatever it is, it's to use that, to, to, to weaponize it against the forces of evil, empire, racism, commodification of human life, desecration of the planet Earth, to which we're called to be stewards, God's own precious vineyard, to apply your vocation to the movement that you're being called to. And the second is this, to hold in the palm of your hand the reality that you may be asked to leave behind the things of this world that help you feel safest. That's a calculated risk. It's not an easy thing. I don't want to make it sound simple by putting it into a sermon, but I'd be lying by omission if I didn't name it as real. To hold it in your hand, the second thing. To choose not to be conflict averse and not to obsess over it, but to be aware of it. All right, this week, this is such an amazing week. The energy in this country is, is, it's off the charts. I mean, we're, we're witnessing some healing taking place in our nation. Uh, we're seeing a new chapter that's unfolding from Washington, D.C. But our nation remains deeply wounded. And each of us has been given a gift of the Spirit, the Bible tells us, different and unique, but the same Spirit. And out there still is a triage. Out there is an operating table a boat full of holes, a building on fire, a lost child, a freezing hearth, a hungry stranger, a desperate soldier, a world still sick with sin and no shortage of want. And then there is you, beloved of God, most precious creation of God, created co-creator. Mend your nets. Don't ever worry about having to abandon your passion or your call. The things that give you joy, God gave to you to specifically apply to the places of pain in the world. But listen for the rabbi's call there at the shore side. You've already got everything that you need to do this work. Did you know that? You've got everything that you need to do this work. Everything. Everything. Amen. Amen.